Hi, kitty cats. I am Amethysta Herrick, your hostess for Gender Identity Weekly, a weekly discussion about identity and gender from the contributors and guests of the Purple Paw Publications website, genderidentitytoday.com. This content here is brought to you by subscribers of genderidentitytoday.com. And if you are, are already a subscriber, first of all, thank you so much for your ongoing support. You probably already know, but subscribers not only receive new content directly to their inboxes as soon as it publishes, but are also able to interact with every contributor directly, including me, which I want to talk to me. So, you know, there you go. If you would like to support shows just like this one, as well as every podcast, video, and written article by our contributors, I hope you'll consider subscribing using the links you're going to find in the show notes. Today, I am so enthusiastic about introducing Dr. Redfern John Barrett. Hi, Redfern. Hey. <laughs> hey. <laughs> so Redfern is an author, a journalist, actually published in Pink News, pretty impressive, <laughs> as well as an activist from a very early age, and uh, just recently published a book called Proud Pink Sky, which looks fascinating. I'll, I'll admit I have yet to read it, but but after watching the trailer last night, like I'm oh. buying this, it is an alternate history of Nazi Germany that just seems fascinating. And we, I want to get into that because it all sounds great. But I'd like to, I'd like to start from like early, early. You know, what what is it that contributes to the person you are now? So, could you tell me about how your childhood experience? contributes to your current like creative process all your writing and all the activism yeah i mean it probably won't be that big a surprise that uh, i was a kind of weird child <laughs> um i think like a lot of uh queer and gender non-conforming people um i was a very sensitive child as well and absolutely wrapped up in my imagination you know um and I used to, I used to love like sort of playing role playing games in my head and playing different roles. Um, and I had, you know, I, I did have like in in some ways, um, my parents were quite good with with like being flexible with how I presented my gender. You know, um, I had dolls. Um, I had this one particular doll, and it was this like little plastic bath time doll. And it it came with like a bath and shower attachment, but I wasn't very interested in that. I just liked the doll, but it didn't have any clothes and I wanted it to have clothes. So I remember my parents taking me to Toys R Us and trying to find clothes for this doll. But because it was designed to sit in a bath, it was sort of, uh, it was, it was sort of uh, sitting. It was at a weird angle. It couldn't be straightened out. So we got these like little clothes for it, these little dungarees. <laughs> <laughs> and um, put those onto onto the doll, but because it was in a sitting position, the doll's ass was hanging out. Uh, <laughs> I feel that really stuck with me. I feel like this was, <laughs> right, like, like it um, would. That was really, um, yeah, yeah. I think I feel like that that was uh, an important moment of my childhood. Um, <laughs> I also had cars. Um, I loved computer games of different kinds, um, and you know, there's a lot of things that you only realise. And again, I think this is quite common uh, on looking back. And one of those things was, you know, I realised after coming out as non-binary that I'd always um, chosen, you know, every time I played a game like or playing games with my brother, like Street Fighter or Zombies Ate My Neighbours. Um, I'd always choose uh, women characters mm -hmm. and, you know, because I, I found yeah, the men very alienating um, and yeah. And it, I just, there's all of these things that looking back were, were quite telling, you know, that, that you just sort of don't piece together. You don't, you don't see the pattern that it's forming. Um, and I, I, I think my creativity took a lot of different forms and, and still does, you know, I enjoy drawing, mm. uh, I enjoy singing <laughs> usually alone. Um, and I, I wrote a couple of stories, but it really wasn't until um, I was doing my doctorate that I started to actually write fiction um, more more seriously. Really? Um, I didn't. I just didn't think it was something I could do. I love books, but yeah, yeah, it never. Well, I mean, especially if you've spent a lot of your your childhood playing role playing games. I mean, was it like tabletop role playing games, yeah. like uh, 
Dungeons and Dragons and, and stuff like that? Oh, no. my brother and I, so, you know, there were growing up, we didn't have a lot of money and my brother and I shared a room and we moved a lot. So in several mm. houses, we, we had shared a room, not all of them. And um, at night before going to sleep, you know, we would talk and uh, we would just sort of play out uh, like people we knew and we pretend to be people that, that we knew and <laughs> take on these roles yeah. Um so it was like I didn't I didn't get to play role playing games, but it was very much like playing with fantasy and and um, playing with being different yeah. people of different genders. And my, I remember being really disappointed and angry at my brother because he, though he was younger than me, he grew out of it, <laughs> and I didn't. <laughs> That's a yeah. shame. Did you ever? At a dumb curiosity, did you ever role play Margaret Thatcher or something like that? <laughs> no i really wasn't very uh aware of like kind of wider politics until like my later teenage years mm, it was um <laughs> yeah it was more like people we we knew in the town we lived in things like that you know <laughs> i see i think that's cool you had also mentioned though um you said the red fern sounds like a chosen name but but is actually familial is that the word I want to use? I guess. Yes. I mean, I, I inherited it. In, <laughs> um, so, yeah, my I was named after my biological father, um, who is also called Redfin. So, and that's that's something that is you know I've never met someone else who I've seen it as a surname. I've never met anyone mm -hmm. else who has Redfin as a first name. Um, but he was actually named after a football player for Sheffield Wednesday. Um, because my family comes from Yorkshire in England. Mm -hmm. And um, the football player's name was Redfin Froggit, which <laughs> I don't think is the most beautiful name to hear. <laughs> um, but my grandparents evidently really liked it. And oh, no. so uh, they named <laughs> yeah. my biological father Redfin, and I am also Redfin. But it is, yeah, it's both a found and it's just both a, a, a birth and a chosen name because I got bullied for being called Red as a kid. I mean, we say we get bullied for things. In reality, I think kids just pick up on things like weirdness and sensitivity and then find reasons. Um, yeah. But I didn't get this. So I thought I changed my name to my middle name, John, uh, which I used throughout my teenage years. But then I re-chose Redfin. And as an adult, I've realized, you know, that, those things that are weird or different, they're, th they're actually strengths. And that's something I really didn't get as a teenager. <laughs> so I rechose that as well. So it's it's both really. <laughs> it When I first heard it, I thought it was Native American, actually. That's interesting that, that it comes from a football player. It, I, a British, <laughs> like, a, like a UK football player. I don't know player. where he got it from. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, it's time to and go I, and look it I don't like it football up. at all. I mean, I'm not a sports person. <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate the name, Redfern Froggart. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wherever, you, wherever you are, Redfern, here's to you. Well done. Thank you, sir. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Was that a proper tribute? Can you do that like a proper tribute with T, first of all? I'm not sure. Yeah. And my Jigglypuff cup. <laughs> yes. I mean, I know he died. Um, and I think my mum, for, for my father's 40th birthday, I think she told me that uh, she got in touch with Redfin Frogger. Um, I can't remember if she said if he actually turned up or not. Um, wow. But he's, I know he's died since because, I mean, my father was born in the 50s and he, he was, you know, so he'd be quite old now if he was still alive. Um, yeah. But the weird thing about having, so I, I, I think names can be very political and particularly for trans people and people with migration backgrounds. And it's yeah. very, very important to get people's names right. Um, and, I, you know, I'm always, if I can, you know, it's copy paste a name. Um, but the amount of people who just seem to sloppily type in a name without really thinking about it, which actually is very, very detrimental for, for people who are marginalized because, uh, I mean, there's other groups as well, you know, who, if you're from a, a culture with, with the name conventions you're not familiar with, if, you're mis if your name is misspelled places, that makes it much, much harder for recognizability. And I think that that is an extra hurdle people have to overcome. Um, but one thing that happens with me that I find very odd is that people will just admit Redfin. And people will be like, here is John Barrett. And it's like, but I gave my name. 
I know what my name is. I yeah. use it all the time. <laughs> but it's it's really common. People just, I don't know if they think Redfern's a title or if I just made a typo and fell on the keyboard and typed Redfern or something. <laughs> um but yeah, it happens, it happens way more often than you'd think. My name is Redfern. I can confirm that. <laughs> yeah, that's really strange that, they, that they'll just omit it entirely. But, but very true, yeah. I think. All the time. You know, <clears throat> names have a tremendous amount of power. Names and pronouns have a tremendous amount of power. Yes, yeah. And, and of course, you know, I think any opponent of the LGBTQ community recognizes that very well, which is why they're happy to, to misuse our pronouns and our names. So actually what if, yeah, that, <laughs> I'm yeah, sorry, go absolutely. ahead. Absolutely. And I, you know, sorry. <laughs> no, it's saying I, I, you know, for me, a lot of it also comes down to intent with pronouns. You know, yeah. I, if it's, if people are doing it by accident, misgendering, you know, and I, that's something that, like, of course, you know, I understand, we're, we're, especially when you've, we've all been raised in a sort of binary gendered society. And it is very difficult to, to detrain instinctive language. I get mm -hmm. that. And it doesn't happen so much now, but I used to misgender myself a lot after coming out. And it took time. And I recognize that. And I want to have the patience of people. Um, but like you said, it's very, very different when someone's doing that from hostility or to disrespect right. you. And I think that that's where, that's one thing that gets weaponized. You know, I think that a lot of people who are trans and queer phobic, they play on people's fears of getting this wrong. You know, their understandable fears of getting it wrong. And they're like, the, the transes, the non binaries they'll get very angry with you if you don't get it right, and then you'll be cancelled. And I think that that's, it's a very clever oh, yeah. thing that they do. Because in reality, I've never seen anyone do that. In reality, you know, we all, for goodness sake, we encounter like actual hostility. You know, <laughs> a well-meaning person at, slipping up verbally, that's not something that I have the time or mental energy to get right. angry about. You know? <laughs> um, but they want to conflate being rude and disrespectful with making yes. a mistake. And yeah, and I, th I think that that's done very, very deliberately. I think that's an excellent point. Gosh, there's so much more to go around that. I do want to ask though, because you <laughs> you mentioned coming out and I'm curious, did that, did that correspond with the act? Because you began being an activist at a pretty young age, like relatively speaking. I mean, did your coming out correspond, or cor yeah, correspond with, with uh, your activism? Sort of. So I've had like more than one coming out, um, you know, and I, I think that, so I came out as gay um, when I was 16 first and um, got into activism as a teenager. Um, it actually, that's another funny story. Uh, I mean, I came out to friends. Um, I was an evangelical Christian in high school, which was oh, a, a, a lot of fun, as you'll imagine. Mm. Um, and... The, but I was sort of like fooling around with with male friends of mine um, at the time, and it turned out after school, all all of the the then male identifying people came out. <laughs> all of them. It's like six or seven people, wow. uh, which is just like astonishing. And it was the one person who didn't come out who. I know was queer, uh, was like actually the only one who wasn't an evangelical Christian. So I think that was like almost like a, a such a strong reaction against it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I came out, but, you know, that wasn't really, gay never really fit very well. And then, you know, I sort of came out as queer later on because that was a more flexible label. I didn't ever feel like I identified, um, and this is something that comes up in my in my books, you know, this kind of, misidentifying as queer and one thing that people say to me um about non-binary identity and, and trans people is oh but aren't gay people and gay children going to be misidentified as non-binary or trans and it's like why is that what you're worrying about and not non-binary and trans people being misidentified as gay you know because <laughs> that's what happened to me um you know, and it's I, again. It's 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 it's. I don't think it's something that's necessarily done in good faith, um, right? But yeah, so I came out and I got involved in in um, LGBTQ politics. Although and joined the at university, I joined the LG 
it was LGB society back then. Uh, we fought very, very hard to have the T added. Um, I was elected the, which is funny considering that I'm non-binary, but I was elected the gay and bisexual men's officer of my university. And again, funny because I'm non-binary, I tried to, I put a motion through to get the the role changed to um I wanted queer officer, um, but some students balked at the term. So it was like the much blander alternative sexuality and gender officer. Okay. Um, anyway, I'm getting sidetracked, but yeah, so that's starting on age. And then uh, I actually um, came out as non-binary in 2020, okay. which was actually quite late and very, very funny because, um, I've, you know, I've written... This is like a character in my book, The Giddy Death of the Gays and the Strange Demise of Straits, Ruti, um, who is non-binary. And it's, you know, I had this whole thing of like um, exploring genderqueer identity and did not think that this... <laughs> And there's my subconscious coming through through the writing, and somehow my conscious self did not pick up on this until yeah, uh, four years ago actually. Um, yeah, so it's it's been a multiple multitude of coming outs. <laughs> I see that. You know, though, I mean, there's the there's the cliche, right? When the how's it go? When the student is ready, the master appears. I mean, sometimes you're you're ready to accept these lessons. Sometimes you're not. I mean. Because for what yeah. it's, when you were talking about being at at, uh, at university, it re reminded me. You said you fought to get the T put into the association at the at the school at the university, yes. and I remember, I can remember seeing because it was just called LGBA where I was, and it. At the time, I was well aware of of my gender, and and that it was not you know what typical people my age were doing mm -hmm. well, let me move on but the like it didn't even it didn't even occur to me that i was part of that community you know it was it was uh yeah. and and it's interesting i think we have a big schism that's occurring i don't know if it's a schism but you know it there's i've had people now comment on my youtube channel but actually both of them were from from, from the uk who said god don't use the word queer because that's horrid like, just don't use it. It's so wrong, and I hate you for it. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> Where is this I mean, coming it, from? It is, it's an element of, of Turf Island, unfortunately. You know, there's a lot that I love about my home country. Uh, there's a lot that's very difficult. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, also, I, I just I hate the argument because, uh, you know, for me, growing up, gay was used as the insult. And also, yes. every single term pertaining to queer people comes from d d d an attempt to use derogatory language yes. and almost all of them are actually terms shared for sex workers which is oh. a really interesting one and i did i did my doctorate on um you know it was, it was in literature but it was between the literature and history departments mm. looking at uh, queer identity and um very fruit punk I, I forget the term faggot, even gay were all terms pertaining to sex workers. And gay also really? was because brothels were called gay houses. Mm. That was one term for brothels. So we've reclaimed a lot of terms. And I don't understand, you know, I mean, again, I think that it's it's something that is different to different people. And it, I do try and be respectful with the terms I use for people. Um, I, I don't really like the F slur, even though I just listed it. It's one that I find quite threatening. I've been attacked while called that, you know, Ooh. so that's part of my history. Um, but other people feel differently. Um, I am getting very sidetracked. <laughs> it's, it's not talking about my doctor. No, no, no. It's, <laughs> just... a, it's a great sidetrack. <clears throat> it's a great sidetrack because much of your <laughs> much of your writing, because you even mentioned in in uh Forgive me. The giddy death. Oh gosh. Giddy death of gays. The giddy death of gays and the strings of the An unbeatably long title. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But, but in both giddy and forget yourself. Shit. Did I get the name right? I did. Right. Yes. Forget yep. yourself. Yep. I'm yep. sorry. I wrote them all down and I'm like, where'd I write it in my notes? Um, <laughs> but in both of those, like the, one of the big underlying themes is exactly what you said, that it's, it's exploring sort of this liminal in between, because you know, in giddy giddy death, there's there's a relationship between a heterosexual person and a homosexual person, but but there's but it's not quite lust. It's not physical. It's emotion. So again, there's a lot of liminal states there. So I'm I was dying to hear actually how the 
I mean, did your did your doctorate work sort of inform some of this? I mean, how do you get this in between states? Go ahead. Sorry. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just so excited you asked me that. Like, I've never, no one's ever asked me that. And it's actually true. Yeah, it did. Um, so my doctorate um, was, it was called uh, Queer Friendship. And I find this absolutely fascinating. Um, well, it came from a personal thing. I actually fell in love with a friend of mine in a wow. non-sexual way. And that yeah. really, that was another thing that caused my sense of identity to, to kind of um, open up. And... I, I, I started doing research into it, and this, I just I just found it so fascinating because, you know, love is something that isn't a constant over time. Love is something mm. that um, actually our conceptions of it change dramatically. And um, so I studied mostly the 18th century, uh, which was a time of great change in how we thought about love and relationships. And it's the 18th century when we start getting the kind of modern idea of um, gayness or queerness in that, um, say, men having sex with men being tied to effeminacy and women having sex with women being tied to masculinity hmm. really comes about in the 1700s. And before that, um, same-sex sexual activity was thought of as something anyone could do you know it was like thought was monstrous but like like murder or theft you know it was something that anyone could do it wasn't an identity it wasn't a social character and in the 1700s that really started to change you start having proto-gay bars um and that had a huge implication on love because before that marriage was really something that was done for um you know, familial reasons to to continue the family line, sure. to enrich or, or ennoble your family, um, and you loved a same sex friend. Romance was between same sex friends. Oh, I so, see. Right. Okay. So yeah. marriage had nothing to do with an actual relationship. So you'd have a marriage, and then you'd have a relationship. Do I? Am I getting that right? Yeah. I mean, you'd have like your romantic relationship would be with a friend. Yeah. Um, and. So, of course, the term meant something very, very different. Um, and, of course, I'm sure some of those were also sexual, you know. like mm-hmm. it's, it's, uh, But the, the language of it was very, very much um, about this kind of... And that was seen as the highest form of relationship for both men and women, um, other genders obviously not having expression at the time. And, yeah, so I studied the 18th century, when, and then homosexuality comes in, and these relationships start to be viewed as suspicious you know as as what we would call uh, gay and um so i studied people who held on to this type of of same-sex love uh, even when it started to become really really unpopular and even dangerous mm-hmm. um so yeah i got very very into how does love work <laughs> uh, what are the differences between sexual physical romantic attraction uh because those are all three very different things um we even you know we conflate physical uh, physical uh, affection and sexual affection which is weird because you know we give kids physical affection <laughs> you know we know yeah. they're different things but we still talk about them like they're the same um yeah and then that that really that really really um came home with the giddy death of the gays and the strange mm-hmm. demise of straits and the whole title is referring to kind of the breakdown of these different identities and very very rigid binary ideas of of ourselves and so it's about yeah, yeah two people who fall in love in this non-sexual relationship and uh they form a polyamorous uh relationship with um the girlfriend of one of them okay. um yes yeah, so it's <laughs> it's it's a very it's a comedy, but I also it's something that meant a lot to me. It's something that I think is very heartfelt um, as well. Is there? Forgive me, I'm. I, I got to hear more about the history. Now I'm, I'm only going to ask oh, you yeah. about your dissertation. This apparently <laughs> I'm throwing every other question out the out the door. Was there an inflection point? You said it was the 1700s. What what changed? Why do why did these because because I've seen this, right? I mean, you can you look back mm-hmm. at Roman emperors and it's just like, well, yeah, homosexuality was totally and completely normal. In fact, oh, I wish I could remember. There's a there was a, a saying that isn't particularly politically correct, but it was, you know, men for romance, boys for pleasure. <laughs> when, when I haven't in, actually heard that, but okay. it sounds, yeah, from what I know about um, the ancient Mediterranean, yeah, it sounds about right. Right, right. Um, but, yeah, yeah, sorry. So, no, so what was the inflection point? What changed? I mean, why? Yes, I'm going to stop. Why? <laughs> 
Honestly, it's such a good question, and it sadly doesn't really have an answer. Oh. It changed around the same time across Western Europe. It changed in a similar time in um, the British Isles, in France, and in the Dutch Republic, at least I know of. I, I looked at those in my dissertation. Um, Honestly, there's not a clear thing to point to. Hmm. I mean, I think um, my own hunch is that urbanization, that the Industrial Revolution transforms society and people moving into cities and then moving into cities, um, there are a lot more people who started having sex with each other. And again, we had these proto-gay bars called Molly Houses. Yeah. And I think that that created an awareness of how pervasive homosexual activity was and that transformed things that's a hunch like <laughs> i did a doctorate so i have to put a massive asterisk to say this i don't have evidence for that but i think that that's at least part of the explanation that it's actually cities are very very uh, are intertwined with the development of queer cultures yeah, yeah. i don't gosh i really i'm really curious because i'm like why? It, <laughs> the, the way you put it was, you know, it went from being just behavior to being identity, yes. which is interesting. I mean, behavior is an aspect of identity, but the idea that this over, that the behavior overrode other aspects of identity is fascinating. What was I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to. <laughs> Send me a copy of your dissertation, maybe. I don't. Oh yeah, it's available to read online. There you go. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's also. Sorry, lost my train of thought for a second. Um, yeah, I mean, it's also you know relationships changed for heterosexual couples as well. You know, it's the eighteen, oh. it's the seventeen hundreds when marriage for love also started to come in. Okay. Um, so, and, and writers like Daniel Defoe started championing. I mean, it's also connected to class, you know. So, like yeah. middle class ideal was like love marriage. Um, yeah. So it's it's really complex, like with all things human, right? It's like yeah. there's not like one thing. It's like a lot of different things um, all coming in together. But right. it's fascinating. I find it. Right. I love history. <laughs> but, but then, I mean, it's interesting to see the progression because then, by certainly by the Victorian era right now sex as a whole is vilified not even just you know homosexual mm -hmm. relationships but hang on you're having sex no 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 no. and we have <laughs> the birth of psychology you know i mean there's all kinds of great things that that we can point to there but you know crazy yeah. wow that was fascinating thank you for all no, I, I really I haven't had the chance to talk about my doctorate in a long time. So <laughs> I, I absolutely love that. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah. If there's there's one thing I like to do, it's talk about things that I, that we that we never plan to talk about. That's the. Uh... In, in fact, actually, <laughs> as long as we're doing that, can, can you show your your Jigglypuff cup again? You, you oh, held it up. But... Jigglypuff mug. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Best Pokemon. It's pink and it sings, you know, and there's a jiggly pop behind me. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what's interesting? I'm very partial to Mew. And I only or Mew too either. It does make oh, a difference. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And I only just recently kind of realized there's a there's a lot of like not obviously masculine, not obviously feminine, and also purple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you were gonna design like a kind of gender ambiguous Pokemon, I think that like Mewtwo would be like up there <laughs> yeah it was yeah. just because some somebody made a comment about pokemon and i said yeah my favorite's always been kind of mew and mew too and i didn't think about that until honestly you said yeah jigglypuff it's pink right i gotta love it and i went <laughs> oh yeah well i wonder if that's why i like mew too so weird that we think I mean about this but <laughs> No, it's true. And there's so many things that like, you look back and you're like, oh, my subconscious really glommed onto that. You know? <laughs> right. You, yeah. you had mentioned it in terms of play, though, that that you had part of your, um, I'm trying to remember exactly how you put it, but part of like coming out and part of, of figuring out who you are involves play. And so I love that, you know, you're able to do these things. But tell, tell me more in, along that vein, if you could. Yeah, because I mean... I, I I really think um, you know we talked a bit before the the show. Um, 
I, I think that as lo- along with, like, you know, sort of discovering things about gender identity, I th- we also, I think, uh, learn to, and I've seen this a lot with uh, non-binary and trans people, we learn to connect with our inner child again. Mm. Um, and because I think a part of growing up, as well as putting into the, us into these like gendered straight jackets, is giving us really, really toxic ideas about what it means to be an adult and to take ourselves <laughs> way too seriously um, and to, to silence the, the voice inside us that just wants to play right. and you know i think i think i i, I have i am very fond of silliness <laughs> i think it's it's very very important to mental health and to self-esteem um and i think that's one thing for me is you know I've, i mean i've always been i've always had a silly side but uh i feel especially since uh you know coming out as non-binary i feel that i felt even more freed to explore those sides of myself it's like you know what i am gonna have like jigglypuff on my shelf mm-hmm. you know? <laughs> and i'm not jigglypuff's gonna be there um yeah and i i think that's something really really wonderful and i think that that's one of the things that um especially when it comes to toxic masculinity i really think that a big part of that comes from severing yourself from your child voice you know from uh the part of you that just wants to to be silly and have fun yeah and i think about this a lot when i see um heterosexual cis men watching sports and you can see how much of that emotional energy has been pent up and then just gets released um and i've seen people who are so you know calm so stoic and then when they're watching sports it's like they transform and i think there's such a there's so much just waiting to burst out in all of us. Um, and I think particularly, again, for, for cis, cishet men, I think that they really, really struggle with that because I think there's a lot of pressure on them to um, yeah. really stifle a lot of their inner voices. And I think yeah. that's really, really sad. I mean, I th- yeah. it feels like that's just kind of Western society, right? We get told, you know, children should be seen and not heard and act your age. and yeah. But I agree. I think that was one of the, what's the word I want to use? It was one of the first things I reclaimed. That's the word I want to use. Yeah. Was my ability to, when you reached out to me and when you pinged me on Mastodon earlier, it, the, my little tag there is Amethyst to Dings. I want to change it to Amethyst to Herrick, but it's a pain. I saw you change yours. I'm going to ask for help at some point that, Oh, um, yes, it's a different instance. Yeah, that was scary. I only just did it. <laughs> yeah, but I also want to change it to Amethyst to Herrick so it matches everything else. But that Amethyst to Dings was one of the very first reclamations that I did because, you know, I was in technology, I was in science, I was an engineer, and you have to be right. You know, you, what I love you no. said, I've got to put a bit a, big asterisk because, you know, it's wrote a dissertation. <laughs> it's like, yeah, but then at the same time, people are like, well, but you have to be right. And that was so it, it has been so difficult for me over the course of my life not to be right. I think this is what yeah. we're trained that that I have to, you know, I just have to be right. So that dings bit, like when I would do something dumb, I started embracing it. And so I actually used that that phrase, embrace the ding, because oh, it was like I was lovely. being a ding batch. Yeah. <laughs> but it's that sense of play that I think you're right. I think we I think we deny and I think we try to strip systematically from gosh, all of society. And it it sucks. And that's how you get ve- that's how you become very, very bitter by old age. <laughs> I really believe that. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's really depressing. But fortunately <laughs> It doesn't have to happen. I mean, I, I think that that's I think that some of the the uh, coolest old people that I've met or older people um is are people who just embrace that silliness, who who don't mm-hmm. restrict themselves that way you know because i think that the the longer that you hold on to this like straight jacket the more you internalize it that's a really weird mental image internalizing a straight jacket but, <laughs> but you know what i mean i got it <laughs> yeah but, but super true super true and i'm you know i'm glad you've found that i've glad i'm glad i've found that and and i want to amplify what you said it's not too late it doesn't have to be that way Go, no. go I mean, it, it, honestly, it's never too, I think 
Yeah, I mean, it's like giving up smoking, right? Your lungs start repairing from day one, you know? And I think that your right. your inner self starts healing from the first day that you start letting go of mm-hmm. these things. And, it, and again, it's not, it's not like it happens in a day. It's something that is a process. It's something that you do have to remind yourself of. And you learn right. more and more about yourself as it goes on. Right, um, right. And I think that's why I've, I've always explored um, identity so much in, in, you know, all three of, of the novels that I've had published so far. It's um, a large part of it has been figuring out, you know, and it's 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 been a long process, you know, um, uh, figuring out identity and what that means and how that can change mm-hmm. and um, in really different ways and exploring it through different genres. So, you know, first was Forget Yourself, which is this sort of dystopian, strange science fiction. Um, then there's The Giddy Death of the Gays and The Strange Demise of Straits, which is this kind of polyamorous, non-binary romantic comedy. Um, and then there's uh, Proud Pink Sky, which is what I like to call an ambitopia, which is like breaking down the binary of utopia and dystopia. Right. Because I think we should break down all the binaries. <laughs> right, right. Um, but, yeah, yeah. For all of those, that's the thread. Yeah. It's a, it's an amazing thread. I do, I want to, I want to talk about Proud Pink's, uh, Proud Pink Sky, but let me ask this question first. Is there, oh. is there an autobiographical element to, to your, your writing? I think the, it's a really hard one to answer, you know, in, in, in a way, in a way, yes, definitely. In a way, no. Uh, it's like you take, a, it's like you take all of these um, portraits of your life, people around you, things you've observed, and then you throw them on the ground and they smash into a lot of pieces and then you rearrange it into a mosaic. That's how I like to think about it. Mm, I see. <laughs> so it's like, little shards and like of course your worldview goes in that i'm not a believer that you can really separate the art from the artist um in most in most cases um and because for me it really really is like these are pieces of my life that i've um you know sort of rearranged and there's definitely elements of myself you know like i i don't i has i I really want to make clear that it's they're not like biographies or anything so i mentioned with the yeah, in, in the Giddy Death, Ruti has this kind of like journey of of um, exploring their gender identity. Um, the pronouns of that novel are another interesting <laughs> angle because I just had a re-edition of it come out from Bywater Books. Mm, yeah. Um, and I updated the pronouns because 10 years ago when it came out, uh, they, weren't, they hadn't settled on they, them being used most commonly. So I, I changed changed it so it could be more relatable to people. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I have, I have to say, I'm not Ruti. You know, like Ruti is someone who um, I think is a bit more bitter and cynical than I am, I hope. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's... And then there's there's uh, William in Proud Pink Sky. And William also, you know, Proud Pink Sky is set in this, the world's first gay city-state. And it's this big, I love cyberpunk. I have some Akira bills on my wall over there. Um, and this towering city-state and William, it's it's a state founded for, for gay refugees. And uh, William moves there and then realizes that um, they're not gay. And... Yeah, that again, there's things, similarities, like William discovers um, in the apartment he's assigned, he discovers um, a lipstick hidden at the back. And then it's this forbidden thing that that William tries. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me, lipstick was one of the first things that that really started to open up my conception of myself. Um, So, you know, that's something that that was from my life that goes in there. Um, But again, I'm not William. (laughs) There's probably similar, you know, William's quite a sensitive person. I think I am. There's some similarities, but they're just like amalgamations, you know, rather than than biography. Yeah, and it does. I'm, I'm actually such a great segue into proud pink sky i have about 40 other questions that came up as you were talking but i'm gonna (laughs) one one of the things that i find most fascinating about proud pink sky at least the trailer like i said i've got to go and buy this now because i saw the trailer and went oh gosh because i'm actually getting goosebumps again (laughs) oh the it was made by a friend of mine and it was so like he he just did it to help me out and it was it was such a lovely thing like and we we worked on that for months so <laughs> thank you so much oh my gosh <laughs> no 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 because here's oof, god i can't the goosebumps aren't going down 
I just I'm <laughs> going I'm going to just re- describe this briefly. Cuz if you don't know the history of of like the LGBTQ community in Nazi Germany, there are some great uh there's some great articles maybe I could link, but you know, Hitler was Hitler was 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 not a not fond of our community. And when I'm seeing a a, a trailer that says it's the first gay state and then Hitler comes on the screen. I went, oh, shit, because I'm thinking the whole thing's going to fall down and it doesn't. Hitler is vanquished. And I just went. God, I wish that could have happened. <laughs> but I mean, so many other people are out there going, really, Amy, really? You wish he could have been vanquished? Go you. The rest of <laughs> the take. fucking world. <laughs> <I'll honey. take laughs> <it back>. <laughs> right. <laughs> but what I found so interesting is that the gay state is not perfect. It's not a utopia. Yeah. I mean, just because I just want to throw these two bits out here. Gays and lesbians live in shining towers. And like you and me, Redfern would be sharing a sharing a brownstone in the slums because the the bisexual, yeah. the transgender, and the queer are in slums. Why would you? Why would you portray our community like that? I, <laughs> I mean this in the nicest possible way. <laughs> I mean, honestly, it's so. I, I really. A lot of it's based in in experience, you know. Yeah. Like when I did come out as a teenager, I immediately came across um, lesbian and gay conservatives who didn't want anything to do with the nasty bi, queer, and trans people who made yeah. them look less normal. Um, those thankfully were not the only type of gay lesbian person that I met, um, but we had a real rupture. Um, the university to society I was part of split in two. Mm. We formed uh, me, me, myself, and uh, the bi and trans people left and formed a different society because it was openly hostile wow. and that was the first instance that i discovered of uh this sort of punching down that can happen in our community mm-hmm. um and i think that there's often a real fear i think that the fear of discrimination leads to you really being afraid of anyone who's seen as even more different to you so you seek to distance yourselves from them i think it's a psychological defense uh, and a social defense. I don't think it's a real defense. I think it's a false defense. Yeah. Um, but I think that that's where it comes from. And I've seen that, you know, I, I moved to Berlin 14 years ago um, with these kind of very dreamy, idealistic idea of what the city is. And, you know, I've met a lot of wonderful people here and had a lot of wonderful experiences, but I was very sad to see that those same dynamics still exist. They exist everywhere. Yeah. Um, and... Really, what I want to do with Proud Pink Sky was not at all, you know, there's a reason that it's an ambitopia. It is not a dystopia. (laughs) It's not a utopia. Um, Because I don't think that you could really um, call queer culture either of those things. You know, it's something that has a lot of very good and very bad extremes Mm -hmm. um, compared to, to straight culture. And I think queer culture itself is is kind of ambitopian. You know, it's it's. I think in some ways um, there's more freedom, there's more expression. There's you know whether it's in terms of visual or sexuality. Um, and in other ways, I think there's you know the trauma creates a lot of self destructive behaviour. I think mm. the trauma creates a lot of segregation, not just between uh, LGBTQ people but but within gay culture itself you know um i've seen <laughs> bears segregate themselves from from uh athletic gays from twinks you know it's yeah. it's and that's in the city yeah. that's the case as well in the city you know it's not just one district in the middle there's maytree which is where the the, the the daddy district there's adonis which is kind of the gym gay district there's twinkstadt and then there's the lesbian districts there's delos which is kind of power lesbian there's flora which is uh kind of lipstick lesbian and diesel which is the industrial zone with like kind of um more masculine lesbians and you know there's a tongue-in-cheek aspect to that but i was kind of really um, again, that's kind of a binary between playful and seriousness that I tried to deconstruct with Proud mm-hmm. Pink Sky. The novel is, it is a world that I spent, I mean, I spent 10 years working on this novel. Um, you know, I, 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 I have folders of like the political systems and like all the parties that don't, that, ex- that exist in this society that I didn't put in the book. Um, oh my gosh. So it's something that I take seriously, but it's also based in this playful look at our, our, yeah. uh, our yeah. cultures. 
Um, yeah, and so queer, bi, trans people live on the outskirts, and I played with architecture as well because architecture is another interest of mine. Mm. Um, so, like, the fancy districts in the middle will be like um, kind of. Um, early 20th century Manhattan, you know, there's neo-Gothic spires yes. and Art Deco and lots of gold and bronze. Um, and then to, each district has its own style. Um, Flora, the lipstick lesbian district, is kind of like this overblown Paris with these kind of <laughs> Parisian buildings that are really tall. Um, and then um, Q, which is a queer district, um, the buildings are very ramshackle. They're not actually made in one go. They're added to. So they've like mixes of different styles and playing with that. And like, yeah. like we do with our identities, with our looks, with our things we like to do with our time, our playfulness. Um, so I wanted these, the architecture to have these like physical expressions of different forms of queerness. Um, I feel like I've gone on another tangent. There's no, a lot no, of things no. Oh like my gosh. Different. No, it's beautiful. <laughs> I do, do, you know, there was a statement you made that like thunked home so hard for me because going back to, oh, I don't even know, it was 1990. For when we're going back like 30 years, I remember talking to a couple of gay men and I said, oh yeah, well, I'm, I'm bisexual and transgender, although I didn't have the, you know, now I would say pansexual and transgender. I didn't really have the, the verbiage for it in, in 1994, but I remember both these gay men going, God, really? Can't you just like make a choice? And I was like, well, why? why? <laughs> right. I was like, why, why does it make a difference? But you made, there was a statement you made, and it might have been somewhat off the cuff, but it so explained the what it is I'm seeing. Because I'm still getting like gay men saying, look, you're taking the, the message I fought for and corrupting it. And it's because when I'm part of that community, yes, it does make them appear to be less normal. Yeah. That was the yeah. way you put it. And what a, I see that. And it's, it's. It's disappointing. Like, I don't even know the word I want to use, but I get it. That 100% explained it. Yeah, and that's something that I explore in Proud Pink Sky, you know, quite overtly is, is why does this happen? And, you know, there's, yeah. there's two main characters in it. There's William, who I mentioned, and the other character is uh, Sissy, who I did not consciously call Sissy because she's Sis. <laughs> People think I did. That's just a funny <laughs> thing that happened on my my subconscious did. Um and Sissy discovers this trans community and becomes a part of it. Um, and she asks a lot of questions whilst doing so. And one of them is like, but from the outside, you know, she's she's from the outside. She's she's moved to the city from from Ohio. Mm. Um, and she says, but you know, you're all queer. You know, from from up from the straight world, all right. of you are the kind right. of weirdos. Right. Um, that's it's a fool's errand essentially but yeah it's something that I, I really want to discover in it and i also hate that like you're piggybacking off you know like i mean trans people have i mean i shouldn't even need to say this have been a part of queer rights movements from the outset of course and you know i mean i don't need to say that um and also like I mean, I, I, I got, again, I got involved in, in queer activism when I was a teenager and I identified as gay then, but I was, I was, I was non-binary, <laughs> you know, uh, I, that was something that was important to me. And I've, I've always encountered trans and non-binary people as well as lesbian, gay and bi people in, right. uh, in queer activist circles. And I think that that kind of, that's not, that's when gatekeeping turns into historical revisionism. You know, that's when you start actually editing out real history and the mm -hmm. actual people who actually fought in That makes me very, very upset. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but it does. The funny thing is, is, I mean, if you look at a lot of why we believe what we believe today, much of that has been historical revision, not just by, you know, the Catholic Church, you know, the, Ro the Holy Roman Empire, but then even, you know, in the United States, we have to look like not the bad guy. You know, and and for that matter, you know, England needs to look like not the bad guy in every uh, in every, uh, you know, altercation. It's it, so so it seems like a common part of the human experience that at some point we're going to go, well, we're going to rewrite these parts 
so that we can we can distance ourselves from something. Um, yeah, I think a lot of people want mythology rather than history. You know, and yeah. I, I, I think mythology is great. Mythology has its place, but not in place of history. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good point. It's a good point. In in Proud Pink Sky, though, because one of the last things that it says on that trailer is that uh, there's a civil war. I'm going to forget it, but it was, there's a civil war brewing or something like that. And then a civil war breaks out or something. And I went, ooh, do you <laughs> do you foresee that happening? Is that is it happening now? Do we need to have this? I I, I actually like to think not. Um, so I, I like to think of Proud Pink Sky as kind of a, a call for solidarity. And I think, Good. you know, some people have said to me, you know, especially as, as trans and non-binary people have increasingly been caught in the social crosshairs in the last couple of years, it's especially. I mean, not, of course, there's always been transphobia, but there's been an intensification, especially yes. uh, from yes. my home country, right? Um, <laughs> yes. But also the US and elsewhere. Um as a quick aside, I'm, I'm living in, in Berlin now, of course, and uh, the German government did just pass self-ID. And from November, I'm, wow. I'm going to be able to officially register as non-binary. And that is something that, you know, this country doesn't get everything right, but uh, that's something that is quite meaningful to me. Um, yes, yes. Where was I going? <laughs> well, it had so, um, c- civil war, civil war in our community. Oh yes, so um, and a lot of people said to me, "Oh, you know, it's so it's prescient." How did you know? Try and it's like, well, I, I picked up on stuff like ten years ago when I started this as a short story, um, and uh, you know, it's just come out now. <laughs> um, it's you know, it took a long time, but it's it's not something that. I, you know, I want to see because I really think that if we do allow ourselves to, to be divided along LGBTQ lines, um, we are extraordinarily weak. Our strength comes, mm-hmm. as it always has, from our solidarity with each other. Yeah, and this is something that you know, like. Um, I, I think I'm really worried people might misread Power Pink Sky because I don't seek to to act, to demonize gay and lesbian people or to divide anyone with that book. For me, it's something that I'm trying to seek and understand the humanity in all parts of our communities. Right. And I think especially with the onslaught we're facing now, and like, it's a simple point to make, but gay and lesbian people cannot kid themselves that after trans and non-binary people and then bi people, you know, they're on the list, um, which we're, we're seeing as well. It's, it's, an, it's an assault on gender non-conformity. And although some people like to pretend that being gay has nothing to do with gender non-conformity, who we're attracted to is a, is a marker of what gender we are perceived to be. I firmly believe that. Um, yes, yes, good point. And I, you know, I, none of us are safe unless we work together. And that is something I don't want to give spoilers for the book, uh, but that is something that by the end of the book, I, I hope becomes very, very clear that actually we need to stand together because we are in a great deal of danger if we're divided. Again, no spoilers for it, but it's yeah. <laughs> uh, the danger is very present in in the latter stages of the yeah. book. Yeah, no, it sounds phenomenal. Um, there, there's. When I first read the title "Proud Pink Sky," I mean, immediately calls to uh, to to mind "Brave New World." I mean, you know, the mm. Aldous Huxley. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm just just you know, there's a, a little bit of a mirror. But what I found interesting, and now I'm going to go into you know the the meaning of your title, which hopefully is okay. But yeah, <laughs> you have proud, so it brings to mind because it's Pride Month now that we're talking. So you have proud. Pink was was a was a label, right? It was the the pink triangle. <laughs> As I yeah. hold up an ellipse yeah. on, <laughs> on my chest, but <laughs> the pink triangle, right? But that was it was a marker of of gay, not queer. So I find it interesting. So there's so you've brought pride into it, and you've brought pink as a marker of as, at least the gay community. Can, will you talk? But then sky is a, is a you know an understanding of what's above what's what's out there for us to attain you know it's our dreams can you can you just tell me more about the title because i love crap like this i'm sorry if i'm going on about it it. (laughs) um yeah so it's I mean, you've covered a lot of it, I think, with that description, really. I mean, I, it wasn't always called Power Pink Sky. Um, I really struggled to title it for ages. I often struggle with titles. 
Um, you might have guessed from the giddy lessons of gays and the strange demise of straight. <laughs> no, um, that's a great one. I love it. I, I love it now. I was very after I did it. I was like, oh, what have I done? Um, <laughs> but it's, it's quite a distinctive title. I think it's also because I studied 18th, 18th century literature, and you should, the titles are like fill the covers of those books. Yes. Right? It's uh, three or four colons Trump. in the title. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> With an alternate title underneath. Um, <laughs> right. For real. <laughs> Crapping Sky I love because it's so much more concise. And I mean, I, like I say, I, I do love the longer title now as well, but um, Proud Pink Sky was really, I was thinking about, yeah, this uh, the sky element is, you know, when we think about the sky being the like little humans that we are, who's always looked up, we've always looked up throughout history to right, the sky, right. you know, um, and for that, we've always got a sense of possibility from it. Um, and that's something that I really wanted to incorporate in the novel. And it is this, you know, very fantastical city. It's a, mm -hmm. I, I love cyberpunk and I really wanted to write this like queer cyberpunk. Um, yeah. And there's this element and, you know, pride, pride, the pride celebrations in the book are a national holiday. Mm. Um, and they become very, very important at the end of the novel. Um, and again, it's, Pride is something that all of us are seeking. You know, pride is the opposite of shame. And as right. queer people, um, you know, I think shame is something that we're very, very familiar with. It's something that um, I think we've really had. I, th I think, honestly, shame is something that all of us feel. Again, I talked earlier about oh, cis het men and the way yeah. that they're shamed continuously. Cis het women are shamed. All of us are shamed. Um, but I think for queer people, we're kind of like, in, in terms of Western culture at least, we're at the forefront of um, fighting against that sense of shame. Yes. And yes. that's what pride is. Pride isn't pride in the biblical sense of um, arrogance. Uh, you know, it's it's really the antidote to shame. And pride, you know, proud pink sky, the city state is set up explicitly for gay and lesbian people, even though, as mentions in the trailer, more people than that were involved in the creation of the gay state initially. Right. Um, you know, but we're all seeking that sense of pride, but it's been claimed by the gay state as being theirs, you know, so it's proud pink sky. Um, okay. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's uh, it just came to me all at once and I was so happy. I was like, oh my God, I love this title. I'm so pleased. Um, yeah, it's... Yeah, so that's that's really it, and it's it's again. I, it, I think Sky also comes to mind alternate history, you know, and it's it's a, it's got a very very different message to this book, but it also makes me think of like Red Dawn. You know? Yes, <laughs> um, right, same. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's. I mean, it's obviously not a, a Reagan esque fantasy. <laughs> um, <but laughs> it's. Yeah, it's it's I have never never did you say Reagan esque fantasy? Yes, yeah. <laughs> never heard that term. That was fun. <laughs> yes, I I don't know. It just fit really really well, and it's yeah. it's titles are so hard, you know, to try and encapsulate what you're trying yes. to do with a work of fiction, and um, yeah, that just absolutely fit, and I'm very very. When that happens, it's it's a relief more than anything. I think. Right. <laughs> no, it's it is such an evocative title because I mean, you had mentioned you know you're pagan, I'm pagan. You know, the sky is the yeah. realm of the gods, right? It's it's yeah. what, what we aspire to and where we hope to go when we've achieved our purpose here. And and it's you know, I guess to have, to have, cool have thing, put yeah, it all I'm, together. I'm, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, and it just. It gives you a sense of, uh, and I think the reason we think of the sky in terms of possibilities is like, it, you. I mean, it's a cliche that you feel how small you are when you gaze <laughs> up at a full night sky. You know, yeah. um, I think for, I've I've never got to see uh, the Milky Way in any real detail very often. The only two times were at Queer Pagan Camp because that was in the middle of nowhere in Wales. Yeah, and, right. Um, <laughs> in the Sahara desert one time, you know, and it's usually, I'm in wow. the city and there's clouds and, um, but yeah, you just get such a sense of, of how utterly small we are and how, I think that's where the possibility comes from. It's just the vastness, the timelessness mm -hmm. of, of the night sky. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> no, it, it is a beautiful title and, and the, the book sounds so amazing. And I, I've got, I'm, you know, honestly, I've yet to order it, but, but I'm going to have like a month where I'm just going to be sitting in Thailand. So I'm going to, I will 
by it and and uh read oh, it while in silence. Oh my gosh, yeah. I will absolutely <laughs> reach out to you, but so Redfern, I'm I'm kind of pissed off because we're like running low on time. And everything oh. you say is <laughs> <It's> fascinating. Really <laughs> <laughs> no, it's so beautiful. I'm I'm loving this conversation and I hate Me too. to bring it to a close. Um can you can you tell us, gosh, I'm gonna do you can see how reluctantly <laughs> I'm bringing it into <laughs> how, how do we get in touch with Redfern and John Barrett? Um, well, I'm on, uh, so I left, I actually left social media, uh, for a few years, uh, mm. cause I didn't like Facebook and Twitter. I found mm. that they, they started getting very toxic and, mm -hmm. uh, now I'm on Mastodon and Blue Sky. Let's wait to see how it all turns out. Um, if you search Redfern, I, you should find me on both of those. Okay. Um, I'm Redfern John on Blue Sky. I'm Redfern at Wandering Shop on Mastodon. Um, I also have my website, which lists all these things. Uh, it's redjohn.com. That's R-E-D-J-O-N dot com, um, which I'm very pleased. I registered that URL a long time ago. It's a very, very short one. Um, yeah, and you can also just Google me. If you forget all of that, just read, Google Redfin John Barrett. You can find stuff, me, stuff about me. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and if, if you... If you read anything i've written have any comments want to reach out I, I love when people reach out like um writing can be a very very solitary and very difficult thing and some of the most meaningful moments i've had as in my career as a writer have been people reaching out to me and talking about what the book's meant to them yeah uh, it's made me cry if you want to make me cry that's how you do it <laughs> understand 100 percent, and i don't even write fiction so <laughs> it means a lot do you do you go to uh, like conferences? Look, as I'm, I'm asking more, right? Did you ever go to conferences or anything? <laughs> do, you, do you do appearances, talk, speaking appearances? I do some. Um, I haven't been to many conferences. I mean, that was more when I was doing my PhD. I would like to go to more conferences. Mm. Um, I've done quite a few speaking appearances uh, for Propping Sky. There were quite a few readings around Berlin and in Brighton, in Britain. <laughs> I did a few there. Um, Brighton is the queer capital of Britain for people who might not know um yeah and that's been really really lovely one of my favorite readings was this little bookshop and it was like too too many people uh i mean that sounds like it was a very small bookshop mm. <laughs> but we, we had to do the reading outside in the street and then oh, we had people join and because they heard the reading wow. happening and they stood to watch and just doing that in the street in neukölln in berlin that was uh that was really a beautiful moment um you can check my website i've got like on the news section on my website i have upcoming stuff on there so and i also mentioned on my social media when stuff's upcoming um so yeah yeah really uh stalk me stalk me online <laughs> <laughs> all right i will put those links in the show notes to to your website your blue sky account and your mastodon account i gotta admit so blue sky i'm i'm really liking actually what, what's yeah i i really wasn't i i found the community on there i mean also on mastodon to be generally really really wonderful and i was mm -hmm. i was worried that blue sky was going to be another twitter um because you know I, I i really actually like conversations with people who have different perspectives on things as long as people come to a discussion in good faith and yeah. wanting to understand each other i love that twitter was not that no. <laughs> But I find Mastodon and Blue Sky, there's a lot more of that. And um, I, I, you know, you can never know how these things are going to change. The internet is always evolving or devolving, however you want right. to see it. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> but so far, Blue Sky, I found to be, um, yeah, I found it to be quite, very welcoming. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. No, I'm, I'm enjoying it. So I'm dying, I'm dying to talk more about, uh, this the the now i will use the word schism the schism between the pure lesbian and gay and the rest of us but but i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna save it for another episode what, what do you think should we can we talk again in I a few months that. okay yeah i would really love that absolutely <laughs> please i gotta read proud pink sky i gotta recuperate and get back from thailand but but then but then um i think there's so much to to cover there around why why we need the solidarity and, and i yes. i honor you for uh for for, for calling that out that's thank beautiful <laughs> thank you thank you um, thank you so much for having me like yeah it's lovely 
Oh, of course. No, I, I don't know. I'm dying. I'm trying so, <laughs> trying so hard not to stop, but I better. We're going a little bit of, <laughs> but 10 bucks says we're, we're going to stop recording and then we're going to talk for another hour and a half. So <laughs> because it happens every time, but so, <laughs> but I will say Red Friend, thank you so much for, 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 you know, agreeing to speak with me. Thank um, you for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah. I also want to say thank you to all of our listeners. And um, I am Amethyst Herrick. You've been listening to Gender Identity Weekly. I've been speaking with Dr. Redfern, John Barrett, about not just uh, being an activist, but also, you know, the, the reason why we need to stick together in order to be strong. So thank you again. Thank you. <laughs>